Hello, this is Laura Ollinger, and welcome to the Positively Healthy Mom on the Spanglish World and Her Networks, Zingo Channels 250 and 251. Please remember to download the Zingo app on your iOS or Android device. And while you download, make sure to leave a comment. The app is free, and Zingo TV is also available on Google Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Fire TV Sticks, Roku and Roku Sticks, and All Smart TVs 2016 and moving forward. So today, I'm so excited to welcome Jesse Coulter, CEO and founder of Ace Cookie Tutoring. So Jesse, say hello to everyone. Hey, glad to be here, Laura. It's been a while. <laughs> it, has, it has been a while. So I've actually been um, done some work with Jesse in the past, and so I'm excited to bring her into my world today. And so Jesse, I'm so excited to, I feel like this is the perfect time of year because we're getting close to midterms. And I don't know about you, but my clients are starting to feel the pressure. And a lot of them have this break off for Thanksgiving week. And so they're gonna either, you know, completely blow this time off and have fun with family and friends, or some of them I know are buckling down. I have one client I met with today who is dedicating one day for each class. Um, just to get make sure she's kind of caught up and up to speed. She's super organized. So, um, you know, what are your first thoughts? I'm going to we're going to talk a lot about study skills and things like that. But what are your just first thoughts, um, first impressions? Well, when you say Thanksgiving break, you're exactly right that we've got two choices. We've got the students, yeah, that are going to make use of their time. And then you've got the kids that are going to be like, I don't have to think about school for how many ever days. And I'm with you. I want all of my students, all the teens out there <laughs> to be like your client and actually use this break. Like for me as a tutor <laughs> in a perfect world, yes, school never stops. And that includes holidays. Mm hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So let's just get right into it. So why don't teens love to learn? And it's so simple, Laura. I mean, that's, that's why I do what I do. The fact is that it's not the teens aren't smart enough. It's not, not, not that someone can't learn. It's just literally our teens are missing study skills. That's all it comes down to is they don't know how to learn because they don't know how to study. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So what is that connection then between studying and learning? I love that question. I really do, because I thought it was clear, but, you know, being a study skills tutor, of course, it's clear to me, right? And so <laughs> while, while I've been talking to mamas and I, I've got that question lots of times, it, it's simple. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so now I try to make sure I, I share it with, with as many mamas as possible. Mm -hmm. But it's simply studying is the process of learning. So we have to know how to study in order to know how to learn. Mm -hmm. I like that. I've never heard that before, but I mean, it makes sense. And so, yeah, when you understand it that way, you know, that probably clears up a, a lot of confusion and stress for people. Um, and what is the right age you think it is to start kind of learning these study skills? I love that question too. You're asking all sorts of good things, Laura. <laughs> so to me, in a perfect world, I would start working with kiddos in middle school. So I generally say seventh grade is the perfect age. Some mature sixth graders do really well with my Love to Learn program. But generally, unfortunately, so many mamas do not come to me and tell their kids they're in high school or even college and either their kids dropped out of college or we finally hit that wall and those beautiful grades that have been going so well suddenly just tank. You know, we hit that wall. That's like, mm -hmm. yep, that's it was going to happen. It's just a matter of when. Yes, yes. Um, and then let's talk about learning styles. I know for me, I am very familiar with learning styles, not just because of my degree. I have a master's in education and health and wellness. So part of what I had to learn is learning styles, but also as a coach, I need to know what a client's learning style is because I need to know how they're best going to process the information that I'm sharing. You know, are they visual? Are they auditory? Are they kinesthetic? And so that kind of helps me see their model of the world and like how they absorb information. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that. That's part of the reason why I brought you on to my summit the first time. And that's why when you asked for, for this, I'm like, yes, let's keep talking. <laughs> so I'm 100% behind that. That's that's what I do. I mean, that's honestly when I sat down to, to figure out what are those 12 study skills I want to teach teens, it started with the learning styles. I was like, you know, that's just going to be like one little module of my program. And then I was like, no, these learning styles, like you said, knowing how to communicate is it's essential. I mean, these learning styles impact every single study skill that I teach and the teens have to know them for the classroom. They have to know them at home. They have to know them when they're learning anything. And so Laura, I would tell you, I 100% believe in them. 
I would even call them only preferences. It's just like that better that they are important. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I've heard so many people tell me, teenagers specifically, that they have trouble remembering things. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have given my own personal advice based off of research I've done or things that I've been taught by others. But I'm really curious, like, what do you say to that kiddo who just has a hard time, like, having information stick in their brain? Well, I would tell you that retaining information is one of those study skills I teach for that exact reason. And mm -hmm. honestly, when it comes down to teens not remembering, like if they tell me I sit down and take the test and then my mind goes blank, then I ask them, well, how did you study? And they'll tell me, you know, whatever they did, whether it was reviewing notes, doing practice problems, you know, or just talking to friends, you know, whatever it is. Well, then I ask them, how do they learn? And nine times out of 10, they can't tell me, you know, or they have no idea what I mean. They don't even know to say the word learning style. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about it. It's like, okay, well, now that we know you're visual, in order to remember, you have to study like a visual learner. And so that mm -hmm. way, when you sit down to take that test, sit down, do that homework. Well, it's in your brain because you studied the right way. Mm. Okay. Well, then I'm going to, I'm going to make it personal because so around here, when you're in eighth grade, we, our kids have to memorize in U.S. history um, or American history, they have to memorize. It's like the um, pre, we, I know it's the preamble, the, what are all those things, you know, whatever those mm -hmm. are, I can't remember all the things, but when my daughter was in eighth grade, she was having the hardest time, like memorizing these, these, they're, cause they're long, right? Yeah. And a lot of the words, she didn't really even know what mm -hmm. they really meant. So she didn't even know necessarily what she was memorizing. And she's a kinesthetic learner. And so I was trying everything I could think of that would, would be a kinesthetic connection in the brain. So we talked about like crossing the midline. I talked about like throwing a ball or doing something physical to activate the body and the senses in that part of the brain while she was saying it. And the funny thing was it actually worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this wasn't this was just something that I kind of, you know, made up, so to speak. So what are your thoughts about a kinesthetic learner? How do they learn best? No, you, you've got the perfect idea. I mean, one of the examples I like to give is, yeah, with, we're talking about memorization or retaining. So I have a kiddo right now that she has spelling words. I, I didn't know middle schoolers still had spelling tests. And I'm happy to hear that. I just didn't know that was a thing out there in the world still. <laughs> I, I didn't know. and But yet I asked one of my older kiddos just the other day. I was like, yeah, you know, because he's a kinesthetic learner. She's kinesthetic. So I, I like to kind of share between students because it's like, mm -hmm this technique might work for you too, because I know it works, you know, but um, she loves volleyball. And so spelling mm -hmm. tests. So we talked about, well, how can we tie volleyball into the spelling word? And it was as simple as like you're saying, we did, you know, I told her to decide, you know, do you bump every, you know, do you bump and then say a letter? Do you bump? And then as it's in the air before it hits your arms, you have to say the letter. So that was something very simple. Like kinesthetic kiddos, they love to move. So, I mean, it can be something physical, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of like sport related thing, or it could be like we were talking about with your daughter having to cross her arms. I have my kids walk. I tell them, mm -hmm. you know, you do not have to sit. Like even in the classroom, I have a kiddo right now. She loves to stand and it's because she's kinesthetic. And so it's like we went through together each class can you stand in this class? And it has to start with, okay, where do you sit? <laughs> right? We don't want her in the front row blocking everybody else. Yeah. And then it also comes down to, are they standing desks in that class? Is it kind of a class that already has lots of movement anyway? You know, obviously PE is very kinesthetic, but maybe it's a class with lots of stations, you know, where it's a teacher that does like lots of little modules every class. Mm-hmm. So. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I don't know if this, you um, work with um, kind of neurodivergent kids, ADHD kids. I assume that you do. Um, I have a lot of those kids as my clients. And so uh, what is your method for working with kids like this who are, you know, have the executive function struggles, have a hard time being organized, have a hard time completing tasks, um, don't even know what they need to do or when they need to do it. Like, what is your overall strategy for that? So I feel like that's two questions there, Laura. So yeah. I would I would tell you that I get, you know, just like we talked about, what's the connection between studying and learning? Mm -hmm. I have, have a lot of mamas that don't know what the connection or similarities, differences are between executive functioning skills and study skills. And the way mm -hmm. I explain it is that there I have yet to be told of or find out about an executive functioning skill that's not a study skill. But 
there's a lot more study skills than there are executive functioning skills. So that's the reason mm -hmm. I call myself a study skills tutor, not executive functioning coach, because something like note taking, something like annotating, those more tactile kind of skills, I teach those, but most executive functioning coaches don't. Wow. So that's kind of thought number one. Mm -hmm. But then when you bring in, yeah, the neurodivergent, neurotypical, no matter what the diagnosis is or isn't, mm -hmm. it's the same skills. Like right. it's literally, they all need the same skills. And then that just also comes down to, again, those learning styles. You know, mm -hmm. I've learned a lot of ADHD kids are tactile, kinesthetic. They need to be moving. Right. And that does not surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. But the more I learn and the more I speak to people like you and other experts, I learn that, okay, there's different types of ADHD because yeah, that's not something I ever studied. I have a you know business degree, a biology degree, so nothing to do with education mm -hmm. that I have worked in a lot of special education classrooms. So mm -hmm. I've, I've seen these different things and they all need the same skills. We just have to personalize it for each kid. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a very, yeah, I, I like that. I like all that information. And then, um, you know, what, when, what we're, what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to moms in just a minute, but right now I just want to focus on the kids. So, um, what strategies do you have for a child or a kid who is just seemingly not motivated to do their work? And that's a good question. I actually, right, not too long before we hopped on here, I was working with a kid on motivation. Mm -hmm. And it literally, the way I teach it, I call it reward systems. And I know some of our listeners might go, oh, oh no, I don't do rewards. Mm -hmm. And the, the truth of it is, I call it reward system. It's the same thing as a motivation system, but you can also call it an if then system. So, what I do with my students and what I just did with this client is we sat down and said, what motivates you? And she gives me, some of those things we all expect, right? Mm -hmm. She has parents that are very generous and are buying her lots of things. So she's mm -hmm. you know, expecting the money for chores. She's expecting this and this and like her birthday's this week. So of course she's got her mind on gifts too. Mm -hmm. But I asked her, well, what do you get for you? Like what's something that you can do for you at home that you don't have to ask mom or dad for, that you don't have to have bought for you? Mm -hmm. And so we talked about it. And she likes to clean her room. And that kind of seems probably strange for a teenager. Mm -hmm. But she's like, I like it being clean. Like, she's like, I like to, to walk in and know where my stuff is. I, I like just feeling like it's mine and it's not like messy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's a motivator right there to clean your room. And we mm -hmm. talked about baking. And, you know, there's a reason cookies in my business name. So, you know, of course, we had to get it a little distracted by, well, what kind of baking, right? You know, but that's a motivator too. So okay. I guess short answer, Laura, would be just having the kids think of what motivates them. It doesn't have to be the tangible things. And we didn't even talk about school. So, you know, it could be what grades do they want? Like the why, you know, what are they working towards? Totally. And I know this is something that you and I had actually talked about in the past. And sometimes I make it so simple, um, kind of even down from that level, which is when we do our work, we feel good. When we don't do our work, we don't feel good or we feel bad. And so I make it as simple as that. You know, um, an example, I would, when you make your bed, you feel good. When you don't make your bed, you feel bad. Or maybe you don't care. But like as far as <laughs> just cheer on accomplishing something that even is not enjoyable, because so many of my kids will not my I call my clients my kids. Exactly. But, <laughs> uh, so many of my my teenage clients are just like, well, I hate this class or it's terrible or it's boring or the teacher stinks and blah, blah, blah. And it's all the complaining. Right. And it's like, but if you do it, you'll feel good, even if you don't like it. Right. It's like kind of as simple as that. I agree. One hundred percent. And I remember that conversation. And you're right. Yeah, that's that's something I've had to learn to tie into my program is that whole <laughs> thoughts to feelings to actions to results and that's something i'm trying to learn for myself and trying to pass it on mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that thing is at the end of the day like there's not one person on this planet who doesn't want to feel good <laughs> right and so it's like if we can kind of emphasize that and it's like the carrot you know it's like well there's always the carrot or stick strategy and some people are truly more motivated by sticks mm -hmm. however if the if the carrot is an option right we want to go for the carrot so we want to feel good we want to get our work done we want to feel that relief. Like we want to either check it off the list or I like to tell my clients, like go jump on the bed, like do anything, <laughs> anything that's a, 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 
celebration because you're getting that physiological response of the dopamine, you know, neurotransmitters like activated. And so it's like, then you tie that behavior to, to that reward. And so then it's like, you're more likely to repeat that behavior again in the future. So, you know, it's all about that kind of behavioral modification, things like that. But I just like um, talking about it because so many kids are frustrated. So many moms are frustrated and, you know, they're all kind of like banging their heads against the wall. And it's like, if we can just simplify it and make it easy. And, you know, I bet you, well, in fact, let me ask you this. How do you make learning fun? <laughs> I mean, it's always kind of hurts a little bit when I, when I have a kid tell me that they don't love to learn because I'm like, why? Like it just, you know, it doesn't seem natural to me that you would feel that way. You know, that anyone would feel that way, but yet once I learn, why they feel that way, you know, that it's just that they're, they think they're dumb, they think they can't do something. And so once I can kind of learn that, then the question becomes, yeah, what do they find fun? So I mean, to me, Laura, it's all about their interest. You know, mm -hmm. like we talked about volleyball kid, you know, it's like, okay, what if volleyball was her number one passion, the question would be, how can we tie volleyball into each and every study skill? So that's mm -hmm. kind of the short answer is figuring out a teen's interest and then tying that into everything they need to do, want to do. Mm -hmm. So I like how your emphasis is really on not the subject, but the study skills within that subject. Is that right? 100%. I, I, I do content, I do content tutoring and that's where I was a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. but the more and more students I met with that didn't come to lessons with notes that didn't know when the next test was that had no idea what they did with the homework assignment. I'm like, okay, I'm getting them through this one class, but I'm not going to help them forever. So they're going to have the same problem possibly next semester or three years from now. Oh. I want to give them something they can use for life. Okay. So I feel like you just answered my question before <laughs> I, I asked it, but I was going to say like, why would someone hire a study skills tutor versus a content tutor? And I think you just answered that question. Do you have anything else to add to that, to that? I know it's it's a little harder to understand. I know a lot of parents can understand, okay, my kid's struggling with math, let's get a math tutor, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily understand, well, it's not that the math that's hard, it's the confidence that's hard, or it's the, my kid never takes notes and then never looks at the notes, you know, so I feel like that's something that I'm passionate about is that I really like to start with you know, does your teen actually know how to learn? That's what my webinar is all about. And that's part of the reason you know, I like to use this. Number one reason teens don't know how to learn. And that's why they don't love to learn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And is there anybody who just naturally gets it and knows how to learn? I wish. I wish. I mean, mm -hmm. I would tell you not only is it a matter of we're missing these skills, then we also get to the point that we stop caring. We stop becoming naturally curious and, you know, if we don't learn for the sake of learning, we don't necessarily know that we're missing these skills because we didn't care about learning anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's why like teens, they just stop love learning because they it's like they just hit this brick wall and they're like, well, I don't know how to do this. And so therefore they lose that passion or the love or the motivation, the drive, whatever that kind of positive momentum is. Is that right? Essentially, yeah, they, it gets to the point of do they have a level of learning for the sake of learning, no matter if it's history, math, science, you know, whatever class, or even if it's a chore at home or a hobby, you know, some kids that care about something, they're going to do whatever it takes to learn that thing so they can make, you know, that goal, that hobby, that grade happen. Other kids, they just, they don't think they're interested in anything or don't know what they're interested in. And so they kind of use it as an excuse to not learn. But mm -hmm. I know we're going to talk about mamas in a little bit, but I would tell you that one of the things I want every single parent out there to do is to value education, because if they value education, then their kids are going to care about learning and care about school way more than they would otherwise. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was going to ask you, like, what is the biggest kind of influence on kids? And I would say that would probably be one of them, what you just said. What else? influences kids to, you know, love to learn and have that passion versus not? I think that's a fun question because I actually just wrapped up a YouTube series yesterday on my channel about inspiring your teens to love learning because I came up in a consult not too long ago. She just literally, she used the word inspired. How do I inspire my daughter to want to do her math? Because she loves mm -hmm. art, hates math. And so we talked about, okay, what are those connections there? Mm -hmm. But I would tell you parents play a big role in not just parents valuing education, but their expectations. You know, some kids, some parents might 
decide intentionally and maybe their kids are aware that, you know, my kid's just not good at this class. Like, you know, like I never know what to say when parents tell me I don't need my son or my daughter to be a straight A student. You know, I'm like, OK, you know, not expecting the grades, but at the same time, if you're okay with them getting a C on the test versus an A on the test, you still have to have the expectation that they pass or that they do you know their best. There needs to be some kind of expectation. Mm -hmm. But I would also tell you, Laura, things like friends. Friends make a huge difference. Like, you know, there's the good kids at school, there's the not so good kids. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if a parent wants their son or daughter to be, you know, interested in this college or in this club or getting this certain level of achievement, it comes down to who's in that social circle outside of mom and dad. Yes, yes. And I see I see that a lot. And there was some a study just put out um, that said, you know, 99% of what your teenager will absorb is through their social network yeah. as far as any type of behavior. And so that makes total sense. Like if they're hanging out with kids who are motivated and like to study, then they're going to absorb that just kind of yeah. by osmosis. <laughs> Exactly. 100%. Because one of my students right now, evidently last two years, he didn't care about grades, but now he's a junior in high school, has decided, oh, I need this GPA to go to this college. And mm -hmm. dad's like, I really don't think he's going to make it. But his son is willing to put in the work. And we talked about it. I was like, who are your friends? You know, could you study with your friends? Because he's very auditory. And he's <laughs> like, they wouldn't do that. And so we talked about, well, how can we kind of keep the, I don't want to say the bro, but, you know, kind of the, the guy, dude, you know, friend circle without yeah. turning it into like Nerdville, if that's <laughs> not what he is, not what he wants to make them. It's yeah. like you could easily be like playing basketball and just say, hey, what do you think about the math homework? Or did you guys understand what the science teacher said? I mean, it could be that simple. Mm, okay. 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 And then here's a big question. Um, what are the 12 essential study skills that you talk about? <laughs> Put me on the spot there. So I would tell you, Laura, I always think I'm going to come up with like a, a fun, like a mnemonic device or a fun, like acronym, you know, but honestly, <laughs> I haven't come up with something yet. And so though I, I always like to share them in the order that I teach them and I teach them in this order for a very particular reason, but I always start with note taking, then we move to annotating and then we have to figure out how to create those study sessions based on learning style. And then from there, mm -hmm. retaining information and then goal setting motivation, time management, organization, soft skills, confidence, self-advocacy. And then my newest one is grit and resilience. Oh, cool. Man, I feel like I want to take your class. <laughs> I want to know all that. That sounds really cool. And so speaking of, I do have a free gift for the audience. Um, I have a download every week. And so this week, um, if you go to thepositivelyhealthymom.com slash study, I do have a free download on building confidence with studying. So everyone's welcome to grab that. So I think I'm ready to kind of switch gears over to the moms specifically, okay. because that is our audience. That is who is listening. So how, what can you offer? I mean, everything that they're hearing now, I'm <laughs> sure is helpful, but what can you offer specifically to the moms that would be helpful to them? And I know there's probably such a wide range of issues that you encounter I don't know how, if you could kind of like encompass it all into one idea or, or what are your thoughts? Yeah. So the simplest thing, Laura, that I can say to our mamas is the fact that we have to help them and we have to help them realize how important it is that they believe their teens know how to learn, that their teens can learn. So like mm -hmm. we, we talked about how important it is for mamas to value education. Well, they have to believe it themselves 100%, but then they have to make sure their teens know that too. And the same thing goes for their for mamas believing in their teens. You know, I don't need the mamas to believe my teen, you know, is going to be like valedictory and, you know, top of the class. Mm -hmm. But I want all of our mamas to believe 100% my kid can learn. And I want them mm -hmm. to share that belief with their teens, like make it without a doubt, because we don't ever want our teens to think that they're dumb. Like we don't ever want to believe that the people that are supposed to be there for them that are having their backs don't believe in them. I think that is so powerful. I love that so much because like we were just talking about earlier, we've talked about how in the past thoughts create feelings, feelings create behaviors, behaviors create results. But the things that create our thoughts are the beliefs. Yeah. So whether it's our own beliefs or the people around us, specifically like our parents, if we know my mom has a belief that I'm dumb, then I'm probably going to believe that I'm dumb, that I'm going to think I'm dumb. I'm going to feel dumb. I'm going to act dumb and I'm going to you know, perform in a dumb way. 
And, you know, it's that cycle. And so um, I, it comes down to identity, which is something that I work on a lot with my clients. And so if a client, you know, and, and this is where, you know, I've noticed that the confidence really kind of creeps up as a challenge on the ADHD kids because they lack the confidence because they think, oh, I don't know how to concentrate. I am not organized. And, and they fill their brain with these things when really they are incredibly intelligent people. They just need to learn how to do things that work best for their brains. And so what do you say to that when a kid is really struggling with that confidence? Well, we start with kind of what confidence like even looks like. And then we talk about kind of why, why we need confidence. Because I, I struggled that when I, I added that to my Love to Learn program, it was mm -hmm. like, do I teach them just some like techniques about like self-esteem and growth mindset and all those kind of things? Mm -hmm. Or do we need to focus more on the why do we even care about confidence? And so mm -hmm. I have a lot, of, a lot of students that are beyond surprised when I tell them we need to have confidence to do something as simple as raise your hand in class, or you have to be confident enough to actually turn in that work. Because there's a lot of teens, they would rather get a zero than let the teen know, or the teen know, the teacher know that mm -hmm. they didn't get it. Like they would just rather pretend, oh, you know, it was a stupid assignment. I'm not going to do it instead of let them see, I only knew how to do problem number one. Mm, yes, I've seen that with my clients as well. Um, and then what else can you offer for, um, moms who are in the challenge of kind of this tug of war or power struggle. Um, I see some parents who are very hyper vigilant about checking their kids' grades online and checking, oh, you have this missing assignment. And right, they're kind of like controlling the process. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's others that maybe don't do that, but there's still some type of internal battle, well, not internal, but battle within the home, yeah. right? About like, you know, why aren't you doing this? When are you going to do that? Huh? You know, and it's very stressful for the team. But yet, if the team's not performing, the mom doesn't know what else to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so it kind of gets a little bit aggressive. So, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I don't know what our listeners are going to think, but I would tell you, Laura, that the reason I work for the teens and the teens alone is because I want them to know how to learn. Like, I want them to be in charge of their learning. I need that uh, advocacy piece. I need that accountability piece. Mm -hmm. And so for all of our mamas that, yeah, have teens that aren't doing well, you know, the question becomes, is the team not doing well because that's what the teen's chosen to do or because mm -hmm. the team doesn't know any better? And so, unfortunately, sometimes the mamas kind of have to back off. You know, and I know I'm not a parent, so I, I can only imagine how hard that is, when, especially mm -hmm. when you see your teen struggling. But at the same time, until that student kind of falls on her face, <laughs> you know, we don't really know, does the teen care? Because, like, one of my students right now, I'm teaching her these skills, but she's not filling out the workbook. She's not really doing what I want her to do between lessons. Mm -hmm. I'm telling mom, mom's, you know, encouraging. Every time we talk in our lessons, mom does this, and I'm just kind of like, okay, you're an eighth grader, about to be ninth grader. You, I don't feel like she's ready for high school. And I just think it's because she doesn't know how to do these things on her own. Like, I really wish her mom would just be hands off and be like, you know when you're meeting with Jessica, you know when your lesson is, mm -hmm. you know what she asked you to do. So do it or don't. And it's your kind of, I don't want to say your fault, but. I should, I should say the word consequences, Laura. Like, I feel like that's something but we need to make sure our teens get to experience. And I say get to, not have to, for a very specific reason. Yes, I love that language. And I love that, that the use of the word. And so, you know, that can be hard, you know. And so maybe that's like kind of my zone is sometimes managing the parents as well. And so it sounds like that's something that you have to do and, you know, have them back up. And so some parents are very averse to their child failing. Yes. And I don't mean just failing like with an F on a grade, but I mean failing in, in, in a way that is a lesson to be learned so mm -hmm. they can recover and bounce back up and say, ooh, that didn't feel so good. I don't want to do that anymore. And so like, what would you say, you know, just as a advice to a mom of like how that can help their kid if you just kind of hands off, let them, let them fail? Well, I, I would ask mama what her goal is for her child. And then I would ask that mama to ask her child, what is your goal? Because a lot, a lot of times parents have different goals than their teens do. And mm -hmm. that could be problem number one. When you were talking about that battle in the house, it comes down to the teen thinks, you know, C's are okay. If a mom is like, it's A's or nothing, or, mm -hmm. you know, you have to play this sport or you have to be part of this activity 
And the teen's like, this is the worst thing ever. My friend's doing this. I want to go do that thing instead. Right. And that's, yeah, something we talk about too, is like values, you know, what are, you know, there's the family values, there's the mom's values, there's the dad's value, like everybody has their own values. Mm -hmm. So how does that work within the household? So, you know, it's funny how that really just infiltrates into what are the values that we want for your grades? We expect all A's or we're okay if you just do your best. I have lots of parents who say, I just want my kid to be happy and that's all I care about. And so to kind of like answer my own question um, as far as like kind of letting go or hands off and, and letting a kid fail is I like to emphasize like short term versus long term. Yes. So, and I think that that's what your study skills program is all about because it's like, you're not just getting a quick fix of they understand how to do this specific math formula, but it's like, they know how to learn. So then they can help themselves. And so that's what I really emphasize too. Like, you know, if they get a, a C or a D or an F when they're in seventh grade, who cares, right? Who cares? It's like some people are honestly allergic to that. They're like, cannot handle it. And it's like, but it's going to set your child up to fail or succeed in the future if they have that little bit of pain right now because they're like, oop, that didn't feel good. I don't want to do that again. Um, so then what about the kid who, I mean, surely you've come across these types who it just doesn't seem like anything is getting through. Like no matter what, they are just like struggling and they're not recovering. Like how do you kind of tackle that? Yeah, I feel like uh, there, there's three buckets of kids that I work with. So I've got the kids like you're just talking about, the kids that they've struggled, like they have struggled forever and don't have any idea what it's like to be successful. Mm -hmm. We've got the kids that are good at some things, you know, struggle sometimes, but not all the time. And then you've got the kids that are totally fine until they're suddenly not. And so like the kids that, yeah, are like that first bucket that just nothing seems to be working. The question really becomes, what does that kid care about? I mean, I had a student that he had all Fs, like literally 50, 5, 0 missing assignments at the end of quarter one. Mm -hmm. And he didn't care. And he mm -hmm. had, he was a foster kid. So there's all that going on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was one of those things he loved to play basketball. And mm -hmm. when we talked after the first lesson, he pretty much said, you know, I want to get good enough grades to play as much basketball as possible. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I could care less about school. And mm -hmm. so we made every single lesson about basketball. If there was a paper to write and we got to pick the subject, we wrote about a basketball player. If we had to do, you know, something science, like we did kin kinetic energy and potential energy. It's like, instead of using a bowling ball as an example, we just made it about basketball. I mean, it's the same concepts. It's just... Mm -hmm tying in his interest. And we were dribbling during sessions. We were doing shooting, you know, we were doing whatever activities we could, not only tying in, you know, being kinesthetic, but then his interest. And so the, the question becomes on that type of kid, how do we get their buy-in? And we have to start with what they care about. I mean, you know, maybe it's a sport, maybe it's a certain teacher, maybe it's a certain subject. I mean, we have to figure out what they care about because everybody cares about something. We just have to actually figure it out and let them tell us what it is that they care about. Right, right. It's funny because yeah, I had a client too that was a big basketball lover. And so he we weren't really working on school so much, but we were just working on he wanted to become a better player. And I said, well, how can you do that? And he said, practice. I said, well, what would a good practice look like for you? And he wasn't quite sure, but his favorite player was Steph Curry. So I like Google, like, what is Steph Curry's workout? There you go. <laughs> okay, this is what he does. He spends this much time doing this, da, 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 practices all these shots. And he's like, oh, okay. So it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun to get into the kids' worlds and what is meaningful to them and what they like. So here's um, another question that's related, which is there's a lot of those boys specifically who just want to play video games. And I have a lot of moms who are really annoyed and very stressed and very frustrated. Like he just wants to play video games, blah, 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 right? And so it's like, well, how would you incorporate that interest into um, studying? And I would, in my mind, think, well, that would be the reward if you studied. But how could you actually, I mean, do you have any thoughts? Like how could you incorporate video games into studying? <laughs> it's not the first time I've been asked that question. So you're, you're definitely right that yeah. there's the reward aspect. The, the question that I always have, though, when we talk about the rewards and the motivation piece is we have to find out what kind of game they play. Because I've, I've, I've mm -hmm. dated enough gamers that I've, good or bad, learned. Like, there's quests, and then there's, like, the little games. I don't even remember what it's called anymore. But mm -hmm. essentially, there's games that 
you can't get to a set point or save point until so many minutes. And like, it could be an hour or two before they can mm -hmm. save and nobody wants to stop playing any type of game if you're going to lose all your progress. Like ro roadblocks, is that one of them where it's like, you just keep going until, or is Maybe. that? I, I, they're, they're unfortunately geekier than that. So, you know, between like Skyrim and some of those, you know, more, whatever the word is, quest games, I think is what they're called. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen, yeah, my kids have, some of those yeah <laughs> and, and so that that can be kind of problem number one to use it as motivation but then mm -hmm. i have a kid right now that he plays some kind of sports game and he's like yeah i can be done in five minutes so it's like okay well then that makes sense for that to be a motivation mm -hmm. but i've also had a lot of kids into D and D, and i don't know a lot about D, &D but i know enough mm -hmm. to kind of be able to make up stuff or at least give them some examples so mm -hmm. like um one of my kids he's what's the word i can call it, like a dungeon master like they create the story Mm. And I was like, well, you know, when you're creating creating these monsters or like their weapons or, you know, whatever challenges, it could be a math problem. I mean, it could be like your least favorite subject or topic in something is the bad guy. You know, in order to defeat them, you have to solve this many problems in this many rolls of the dice. You know, like if you roll and you get like a three and that's supposed to be like your attack or defense or something like that. Well, you have to get this many questions right. You know, mm -hmm. or you have to study for three minutes before you can, you know, get past this. So, I mean, it could be something as geeky as that. I've had other people that, you know, I tell them to make, I, I like to use board games more often than video games, but because any board game can be made into a study review game. But, you know, characters can be made into anything related to school, too. Mm, fun. It's see, yeah. learning, learning can be fun, right? <laughs> exactly. It just, it takes work. I mean, it takes how creative do you want to be? I mean, when I have kids that don't play video games and I have kids that don't play board games, I'm a little like, no board games. I'm like, didn't you at least play like Candyland? Like, I feel like we all started with that. And yeah. they're like, oh yeah. And then I ask them about how the mechanics and they tell me about the colors and the blocks. And I'm like, so now each color is a subject or each color is a chapter if you're studying for just one class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then how does all, I think this might be obvious, but how, would, how does all this information that you have translate to college kids? So I would tell you it's the same study skills. And I would tell you, you know, when you're talking about, say, note taking with a seventh grader versus like a senior in college, yeah, it's different because it might be, you know, two or three things they wrote down today versus two or three pages but at the same time, they're still using the same seven note taking rules. Mm -hmm. So the answer is it's just, you know, it's more mature. You know, mm -hmm. it's actually it's actually a college kid that we talked about D D with. So, you know, you can sometimes see on his face, he's like, Jessica, you're saying it all wrong. But I'm like, but I'm making sense, right? And he's like, Well, yeah, you really mean this. And I was like, but you're getting it, which is what yeah. it's all your matters. <laughs> Come on, come on. Yeah. Uh, yes. And then how, um, what, do, what do you teach your clients about self-advocacy? So that was something else I added pretty recently because it was like already in my program, but I had enough parents asking for it. I'm like, okay, this just needs to be like one entire lesson by itself. Mm -hmm. So we talk about kind of what it looks like and I let them know what the options are. Mm -hmm. And something that I found really, really powerful is when we go through some examples like sending an email, talking to the teacher before class, raising your hand in class, like we talk about what their order of preference is. And that's been something super powerful, I think, mm -hmm. because I've had a lot of kids they are like, I don't ever want to see the teacher before school. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, but now if you know that's what you want, when are you going to find the time and how are you going to ask for help if that's not an option? Mm -hmm. And then I also make sure the kids know how can you get the help you need in your learning style? Because that's a big part of my program wow. is helping kids adapt. Because, like, I had a history teacher. He talked and talked. I am not an auditory learner. So he could have said nothing, and I would have gotten more out of the class if he just would have said, here's the book, figure it out. Mm -hmm. And then you've got kids that need that talker. So maybe the teacher, when they go to ask for help, is just writing stuff down on a piece of paper saying, go read book three. You know, that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. I tell the kids, you've got to get that teacher to meet your learning style. And unfortunately, the teacher is going to teach in the way he or she learns. And if that's not the way you learn... Well, then it's up to you to figure it out and to adapt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, what else can you give as just overall guidance for, you know, I don't know why, but it seems like moms are kind of the, you know, I always say we're the emotional kind of mothership of the home, but also it seems like we're a little bit of the academic. And I know dads are, are involved in some more than others. Yeah. 
But um, what can else can you do to kind of encourage, support, motivate moms who, you know, do have kids and, you know, are struggling kind of because their child is struggling? Like what, what else can you say that would be helpful? So I would tell you something that I've learned from different discussions and uh, I've applied myself is I've had to learn that I can't care about school or about my students' grades more than they do. And I got to say the same thing to our mamas, that you can't care for your kids because that's who you're talking about, you know, getting them to kind of back off, to let go a little bit. Mm -hmm. If the mama cares more than her son does and her daughter does, then your child has no reason to care, you know? Mm -hmm. know, It doesn't hurt me. Like you talked about that sting, you know, it doesn't hurt me if I get a C because, you know, whatever, mom's going to call the teacher. I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of parents now that had to happen at school. It couldn't have possibly been something their child did. And yeah, sometimes there's good teachers, sometimes there's bad teachers, but usually something can be done on the child's part that the child's just forgetting to mention to mama. (laughs) That is such a fantastic response. And that's actually true with my coaching clients as well. I can't care more about their success than than they do. Otherwise, it won't work. And kids are very sensitive to this, whether it's the, through the moms or, you know, me or you or whatever. They have like the spidey sense and exactly. they feel it energetically. They're like, oh, they care a lot. So I'm going to step back. Like, right. It's like this kind of like magnet thing, these, those opposing magnets and the, and the closer you push, the further they're going to kind of back up. So it's like, you got to give them some space, let them, you know, decide what they want, ask them what they want and, um, you know, allow them to kind of uh, make the moves that they need to make and kind of figure that out. So I do occasionally, and maybe this is a little bit redundant to what we already talked about, but I do occasionally have um, kind of parent teen who situation who they're at a loss. They're like at a loss because they are struggling with friends. Mm -hmm. They are home. They are, you know, not feeling good about themselves. They're struggling academically. A lot of I have clients who come to me that are barely about to graduate from high school, like they might not graduate. And it's very frustrating for me because I'm like, if you would have come to me sooner, <laughs> right? They always come to me like when it's urgent and like last minute. And it's like very like, oh my gosh, this is like the pressure is on. <laughs> Do you find that if people come to you kind of like, you wish they would have come to you six months sooner or a year sooner? Is that kind of a thing? No, it's a hundred percent. And I think the thing that we can both agree on, Laura, is that it's so much easier to be reactive than proactive. It's so much mm-hmm. easier to suddenly be pushed to that point of, okay, it's, this is it. Like this is, it can't get any worse than this. And it's so easy to keep thinking up to that point. Oh, he'll figure it out. Or, oh, you know, you know, she, she knows what she's doing and she'll, she'll want to do it eventually. But yeah, that's that's the reason I've struggled so hard to go. Do I say I'm, you know, I, I work with tweens? Do I go work with teens? Or do I work with college kiddos? Because I want the tweens to come to me. But so many parents, <laughs> yeah, I heard a little bit earlier when you're talking about, you know, seventh grade and grades. So many parents think that grades in middle school don't matter. Mm-hmm. And I'll admit here in the States, yeah, it seems like a lot of middle schoolers get pushed, you know, which is unfortunate to everybody. Right. But the thing is, in middle school, that's the perfect time for our teens to learn how they learn. It's the perfect time to decide, you know, do I want to have a green folder for math or a red folder? You know, like literally, does the color matter to me mentally? and Does it have any influence on how I view that class? And then also, you know, do I need to write my notes or can I listen? You know, because there are some kids, <laughs> you tell them how what their learning style means and they're like, I don't want to write notes. Well, you know, we talk a couple of weeks later. What did you guys talk about two weeks ago? I don't know. Did you write it down? No. Well, how else are you going to remember based on your learning style? Yes. So we're going to go through that middle school when it's kind of low risk versus high school, (laughs) which is, you know, as soon as I take a class, they have a GPA. And just like you said, with the graduating, yeah, I've Mm -hmm. been there, done that. We've had plenty of students where, like I talked about that basketball student, D, we had four days, four days to get 50 assignments in to make sure he could pass quarter one, so he could pass semester one and then play next semester. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I have a couple right now that it's like that graduation uh, is a little in uh, curious right now. Um, and it's funny because you and I were, we run such similar paths because I too also work with tweens, teens and college kids. And it, it's ex- literally exactly the same, whereas it's, but it's mostly 
confidence and self-image and these things like that. And if these parents, some of them I have yet worked with as young as a nine-year-old in third grade, and I have to tell you, it was amazing. We were done in, I don't know, six weeks, maybe eight sessions at the most because she was young and it, it, it she's very pliable and it, it sticks in and she implements everything. And now she's great for life. Whereas, you know, I've got a client right now who's a junior in high school and, you know, I so wish I could have had her five years ago because it's, she's been in the same exact pattern of very negative thinking for all these years. And you know how those neurons connect. And I, I was explaining to her how the grooves get deeper and deeper and deeper. And the more you have these negative thoughts, the kind of more challenging it is to get out of it. It's not that you can't do it, but we need to like rezone and go into a more positive lane in our thinking and build those, those neuron connections. And so I'm like, ah, oh, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's, and, that, and that's the thing. And I get it. If you got kids and everything is a financial investment and, you know, it's hard to really want to you know, I'm the mom of four kids. It would be hard for me to want to be really proactive about every single aspect of their life. You don't really necessarily do that until there is a, a, a very evident, very obvious issue. And you're like, okay, now I'm going to fork over the money to try to fix this problem. So what are your thoughts about that? Oh, I think you've got the magic word there, investment, because mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of parents, especially when I talk to them in my consultations, and they're like, wow, that price is high. And I'm like, yeah, but think about the fact that it's a life skill. Think about the fact that if we teach your teen how to take better notes, figure out how that calendar, that planner works now, that's the same system your teen's going to use, you know, next year, five years from now when they're in high school, college, and that same system is going to be in place when they have their first job and for, you know, everything they ever want to learn. So mm. the fact is investment, yeah, that's the better word because it lasts forever and then, you know. I offer my, my program and my, my lessons and all my recordings, you know, for life. So, you know, I give them that too. <laughs> yeah. So it is, it's life in, you know, it is an investment because they're investing in their child. They're investing in their child's success and, you know, it is going to pay off, you know, you're going to more than get your money back, right. When you're, um, you know, accomplishing or achieving at a higher level. And so I was just curious and you might not be, this might not be your lane, but what kind of like um, guidance or, you know, can you offer for kids trying to study for the ACT or SAT? Ah, uh -huh. that's a good question too. So the answer is I do ACT, SAT prep. So like that, that's oh, kind do? of, I do. Yeah. And so I thought that's where I wanted to specialize. You know, that's where I wanted to focus. That's why it's ACE cookie tutoring. So it could be ACT, you know, the acronym. <laughs> yeah. But, but I would tell you that study skills, you need them for every learning opportunity. And I would I will admit that there are a lot of study skills that are test taking studies, but at the same time, there are some things that, yeah, when you sit down and take the ACT, you sit down and take say like finals at the end of the term, that you know, you need certain strategies that aren't really study skills. But I would tell you though, but going back to those learning styles, you know, I have kids that don't take notes <laughs> when we're going through like the ACT and part of me goes, you know, annotating can be as simple as, okay, we talked about problem two. I didn't understand problem two. I mean, that to me is a study skill right there, marking the problems because we go through, you know, I try to go through, you know, at least one passage per session and we're figuring out the pattern. You know, is it this, you know, not only is it which section, but it's also figuring out what types of questions in each section and then mm -hmm. you know for i don't know how familiar our listeners are but you know there's different kind of categories of questions in each section on each test mm -hmm. and we've got to figure out okay which type of question is your teen struggling with and then we have to decide do we care because it could be there's like three questions of that type in that entire section right. it is not worth your time and definitely not worth your child's time to focus on that type of question unless we're going for a perfect score because everything else is already as perfect as it can be. And that yeah. does happen, but not as often. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I was curious because my daughter's a sophomore, so we are, are kind of entering that zone of preparing yeah. and she took the PSAT at school. And so we are, that's on our, on our radar right now. So we are getting close to the end of our time together. And so I'm really curious, like how can someone work with you? Like, what does the process look like and how do people find you? Definitely. So I really want mamas to join my Facebook group. So teaching teens to love learning. So that's an awesome place to start. And then also I really want them to meet me one-on-one -on -one with their teens for a free consult. So a great place to do that is at my website. So acecookietutoring.com. Okay. Okay. Good to know. 
Um, and yeah, and I encourage any of your, you know, people to follow me at the Positively Healthy Mom. They can jump on my Facebook group. That's a group that is just to support and encourage moms in all kind of areas. It's really kind of encompass encompasses, you know, mind body, you know, health and wellness, um, just kind of motivation, support, encouragement, kind of anything that a mom would need to feel successful and not just successful, you know, from a certain standard, but feel good about herself. And then also um, to just kind of feel good about being a mom. Cause a lot of us moms are, you know, we're beat down, we're worn out, we're exhausted, we're stressed, we're tired, we're overwhelmed. And especially like I, this time of year, the holidays, it's always like this three times of year, the back to school, the holidays in May, when we just, our minds are kind of just like blowing up, right? Cause it's like, we can't really take in any more information. So again, invitation to your audience um, to kind of join me as well. And I'm here to just uh, support and encourage you. So um, any last words, Jesse? Oh, just, just know that the semester is not over until it's over. So if there's things to do, <laughs> or there's things to study, have your teens do that. That's what I want our mamas to do. And I want their teens to do it for them. But, you know, they might or they might not. We got to hope. We got to encourage. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, so this show can be heard on the Spanglish Radio Network at spanglishworld.ca. For all news and programming, Spanglish World, watch it, hear it, read it, download it, live it. And Jesse, thanks so much. And I hope you have a wonderful holiday. Thank you so very much. Take care.